tell us that he saw something in us, then he pulled us out and says, come, start sharing this thing with other people. And so, I, in, in a way, that's one of the reasons how we end up here, because he has always been, he opened the doors, like, and Apostle Abbe Collins has also been one of those critical ones. I think Apostle Abbe Collins is the one who, I don't know, I don't know who started how, but he, he, he was one of the initial door openers, and he has brought many people to the mentorship. But when he took me to Pastor James, and then Pastor James just, because he has a lot of, he has led with honor for many years, so he has many friends. There are many people who, who have many enemies, but everywhere I go, and I mentioned Pastor James, there seems to be friends. So it's sort of a, a password. So thank you, Pastor James, <laughs> for the password. Now we have just a short time, and I know maybe half of us here in the mentorship and half are not. And so we have to figure out how to be beneficial to both. And we have just a short time to share about uh, ministry. How do you grow and multiply a ministry. And I hope you are interested in ministry. Yeah, like Apostle Abekons was saying, we, when we come to mentorship, we don't testify about new cars or houses or dresses or shoes or wardrobes. Or other. It's not that God is not doing those things, but that's not the focus. For us, our whole focus is the ministry People, and ministry is people. People getting saved, getting discipled, getting sent to repeat that cycle. So that's what we are really passionate about. Now, let me see where I've been trying to figure out the best place to start in this setting. But let me start. Is it okay if I come down here? You know, when you're in a new place, you first get to know the rules. <laughs> My counselor is like, go back, go back. Someone at the back is like. <laughs> wow. Uh, Proverbs 24, I believe it's verse 3, thereabouts. If we start there, we'll be okay. Oh. They are going to put up some scriptures. It has come, eh? Okay. Uh -huh. Together, through wisdom, a house is built, and by understanding, it's established. First of all, have you seen that at wonders, even, even the background to the verse? Is... Wow, it's a wonder. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Apostle Abbe Collins and Pastor Violet. Thank you for the excellence. Like they were saying, when you have a 50 by 100 and then God does all of this and three church locations, now I will see where you're going. And it is far and significant. These are the things that excite some of us. You know, when a church gets its own property, so no one can come and say, not today. Locked. Ah. Mm. Feel like a church that has its own property is going to be a headache to the devil for a long time. <laughs> it's like now officially official headache to the devil for a long time. So this is really significant. Now, he says, through wisdom, a house is built and by understanding, it is established. Let's read the next two verses, then we'll try and get to it. It says, uh, by knowledge, the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Actually, it's just those two verses. So through wisdom, a house is built. By understanding, it is, yeah, you know, <clears throat> built and established are different. Built is like founded, hmm? set up. <laughs> what a shock. <laughs> wow. 
welcome, Pastor Philip. Founded, set up, yeah. But then it says, by understanding, it is what? Established. You go from, here is a church, which is built, to the church is now, it, it can't be wished away. It is an establishment. I had the, the delight of visiting Worship Harvest Gayaza yesterday. <coughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they were only 43 people away from having a thousand people attend the garage physically. <laughs> now, uh, one day you will know how to how complicated it is to have 1,000 people attend your service. <laughs> when we were young, we used to think that we see people do it, and you think, cup of tea. <laughs> now we are less young, and we know it is not a cup of tea. So we are looking at a scripture in John 11. And we're talking about Martha and Mary uh, in the town of Bethany. Okay? And you know how they used to name people in the Bible? They didn't have two names. So like Jesus Christ is not uh, Jesus, the son of Joseph and Mary Christ. <laughs> Christ is just a designation. is Jesus, the anointed one. But his real name is Jesus of Nazareth. Okay? So Mary and Martha of Bethany. Joseph of Arimathea. David of Bethlehem. You, you got what I'm saying? So, and I was telling them prophetically, and maybe I may as well tell you, that may your town get to be known by you. Yeah. Where, where the only reason it is known is you. Like many of you, you know about Reading in Southern California. It's because of Bethel Church. Otherwise, how else would you ever know about Reading? Yeah, so we are going to shift this thing to the degree that people, you see, people out there th still think that Amin is still our president. <laughs> it's so annoying. <clears throat> but we are going to change the story until Uganda. Oh, the city, wherever your church is, is known by your church. Yeah. Yeah. So they say, you're going to, where is that? Oh, is that the city of this church? Ah. You see, the only part that works for you is the part you believe. So I'm thankful for those who believe. <clears throat> it shall happen. Where it's like, where are you going? Ah. You see, like in Gaba, for me, honestly, the only thing I know about in Gaba is uh, Gaba Community Church. <laughs> yeah, like what else do you know about Gaba? National Water, okay. Then what? Gaba Community. So that's, that's what God is calling this generation to. I'm going to go off script and, and just get. <laughs> you see, friends, our fathers. Our fathers, like Pastor Robert Kayanja, Pastor, hmm? Pastor Gary Skinner, uh, Pastor Simeon Kaiwa, Pastor Dr. Joseph Serwada, <clears throat> and, and many, many others. <clears throat> they, they fought to build the church in a very unfavorable time. Many of them started their churches in a time of war. <clears throat> yeah, the, it, it was unfavorable. It was in a time of war. You couldn't find people to serve. Those days you could have one graduate uh, on a village and that was a miracle. There was only one university. Can you imagine the time when these people started? They started when there was one university. So for you to have a graduate in your church, they needed to have come from that university. 
There were all sorts of things. You needed permission tits to buy soda. Soda was for only weddings and you had to book many weeks in advance to be able to get a few crates. Otherwise, people drank orange juice. And yeah, do you remember the means of transport those days? Peugeot. Those Peugeots where you sit facing each other. Huh? Pidgeot ye. <clears throat> with the door at the back. You enter and one side is facing this way with a car box type what? People's transport. <clears throat> Why uh, am I talking to people who are like 20 years old? Why are people looking at me like they don't know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yeah, but that, that, this is not, uh, I'm not seeing here. Teenagers, they are not the majority. I'm talking to people who have been around for some time. Oh, oh, you are refusing to be responsive so that you don't say you had the message I was talking about. <laughs> some of the villages never even had these ones. Yeah. When my mother was going to town, I, we lived in a, a village called Motai. She had to organize herself because there was this one bus. She had to take to town and to get it before it leaves town in the evening to come back. Now, all the things you're seeing these men of God have done, they did them with that. You can say they far superseded expectations. Now, we cannot come along Let's say they were the Moses generation to take people from Egypt. Out of Egypt. Yeah? Then they hand over to Joshua. And then Joshua continues dragging people through the what? The wilderness. No. We, I believe we are the Joshua generation. I believe if you think about Jesus, Jesus ministered only within Israel. It is in very few cases that he left the boundaries of Israel. Now imagine him handing over to the disciples and they also now just continue around Galilee, Galilee, Jerusalem. Mm. Say I'm understanding. Do pastors understand? Okay. What, what do you think? What do you really think heaven's expectation of us is? What was heaven's expectation of Joshua? To do what Moses did. Get them out of Egypt and first arrange things. To do what Jesus did greater works. So, you and I, we have to embrace the responsibility on us now. Because if you think about it, the fathers fought hard to get something going. I was talking to Pastor Michael Chaz a little while ago and we were saying, Mwanagwe, if you say that we have a local Etebali Banji, there were very few people who were known as what? Barocal. Even if you said you were local, you are there. Everyone would be like, what? Aliwa. <laughs> now, it is normal. Yeah, so it's, it's even fashionable. Now, are we going to do. Are we going to stop where they stopped? Because, you see, they fought hard. But they didn't manage to take the Ugandan church global to have churches from Uganda planted all over the world. That, that is now our responsibility. So I hope you have already enjoyed enough of your 
current status as the big man in your church. Because I can tell you, <laughs> there is no way we are going to go to heaven like this and appear before Jesus and say, yeah, our fathers did great things. And, you know, we... we yeah, but you also, you, you have anointed them now for us. What are we supposed to do? <laughs> uh, wow. Is that what we are going to do? No. We must embrace the challenge of the greater works for every generation. Oh, yes. If, if we don't do greater works than the fathers, we will have wasted their sacrifice. Yeah, that they fought to get us here and then we just played in the thing. We must work hard to prevent the curse of greatness skipping a generation. You see, out there, in the world, they say greatness skips a generation. Because the children, and they, they are not, they are too comfortable. They don't take things to the next level. It's the children of the children usually who then step up. Now, I, we must not allow that thing. We must not allow that thing. Yeah. And I, I hope you didn't come here for entertainment. When they told you there is a meeting at Wonders, yeah. I'm going to either inspire you or offend you or annoy you or something. Yeah. But other than just leaving you alone. Because even me, I'm irritated with myself already. So if, if you see me, just know it, you're not the problem. <clears throat> so we cannot continue the way we are. Because you know what? We are running out of time. Yeah, by the time Pastor Robert was my age, what was he doing? Yeah. Yeah. How many countries was he ministering? Uh-huh. So, how about you? How about me? Uh-huh. We are there, like the Masoka said, to Likufuru Kutana in our little things. <laughs> it's time to pick ourselves up and realize that we have a mandate that goes beyond your church. We have a mandate that goes beyond your church and all your problems you're dealing with, fundraising, blocks, bricks, what, what. Look, all that is part of the process, but the expectation is actually higher. <clears throat> yeah. You mean we are going to organize ourselves and die without having churches that are greater than Watoto and Miracle Center and what? Like what kind of thinking is that? Yeah. For my fifth year dissertation and what, I, I interviewed a lot of pastors and I talked to Pastor Robert. You know, Miracle Center, that one sits like 10,000 people. So now we have all connived to build smaller things. <clears throat> yeah, like, ah, all you are 10,000. Okay, we can understand when we start the way we started, even me. I'm, I'm, you know, I don't have one finger out for looking back at me. But as long as God gives us life, we must wake up to the reality that the expectation of heaven on our generation is higher than that of the fathers. They didn't expect Joshua to take them back to Egypt or keep them in the wilderness. They didn't expect the disciples to minister in, 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 in Israel. So with that little background, <clears throat> through wisdom, a house is built. <clears throat> One of the most fascinating things to look at in the Bible is generational things. 
and then you you see like in light in light of actually what I'm sharing, you look at a a, a person like David who fought many battles to give Israel peace. Now, that also is, is, is its own issue. There are battles we must win. In our, you know, there are battles they won in their generation. You see, like, it's not illegal to be here and speak as born-again people. There was a time it was. So now they won that one. <laughs> oh, God. The pastors, the pastors. So every generation must win certain battles that their children should not have to fight. Yeah. David settled the issue of the Philistines once and for all. It is what enabled Solomon to reign in peace. Because you can't build in the time of war. You can only build in the time of peace. Solomon, the Bible says, God gave him rest on all sides. And he was able to build. King Asa said that now that the Lord has given us peace, let us build. Do you get what I'm saying? So, for example, the, 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 that generation, they were called Chiwempe churches. Why? Because they were just trying to get things going. Now, uh, what a shock if, if our generation also be called what? Yeah. How can we, how can the fathers have been named that? Because they are fighting the Goliaths to give us a better chance. And then we also show up, eat all the money, drive big cars, and build nothing. When they had one, two graduates in their church, you, you have 50. With jobs, 100. Ah. Uh, <laughs> mm. So Solomon, rather David fought, 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 fought. Yeah. And then Solomon came and took things to the next level. He aced it, so to say, right? Now, here is what's fascinating that David was uh, it's called the sweet psalmist of Israel was a man anointed by God but what was the mark of Solomon's life what, what was Solomon known for wisdom I says through wisdom a house is built. I'm assuming that at this point you are either fully or at least halfway convinced that the house of God the church is the house of God and it also is built through wisdom now one of the things that has one of the things that has let me say that what what a shock fail is that we look we have looked at the fathers and what they've done and really i think i need, I need to put this well so it is not misinterpreted eh? so the way God equipped the fathers was for them to get us where we are. But I think, I suspect that God may equip us differently. Still by the same Holy Spirit, still anointed, but I believe that this generation has to operate with an element of wisdom much more than the fathers had to. To build the house and establish it and feel it. Do you get what I'm saying? 
So while we cannot give up on the practices they taught us, like prayer, fasting, preaching, evangelism. Nowadays, churches, they fear evangelism like, as if it wasn't part of the plan. Prayer, all those things we must do. We also must now add a thing that God is calling our generation to be able to fight well, which is a lot of wisdom. A lot of reading. A lot of studying. A lot of exploration. A lot of visiting places, following, understanding, basically gaining wisdom to add to these things. To be able to build the house of God for in our generation to the degree that God expects us to. I hope I'm making sense. So you find that a pastor who is not into reading and information is already shortchanged. Yeah. You are like one who beats the wind. You're just fighting in, you know, things that you, you yeah. So that, that's, why, that's why we are here today. To understand that a ministry we can't just keep going. You know, there are all the things they did. We have to do them. We have to do crusades. We have to do door to door. But we just can't do it. You know, <clears throat> wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. Yeah, someone says it is knowledge to know that a tomato is a fruit, it is wisdom not to put it in a fruit salad. Am I making sense? <laughs> so, it's a fruit salad, put tomato. No, tomato goes in a vegetable salad, even though it is a fruit. That's wisdom. So, you find that people are doing all these things, but they are not connecting dots. How is my prayer life connected to the church's prayer life, connected to the evangelism? What, what happens after evangelism? For us, we just go lead people to Christ and leave them to die. And have someone else have and lead them to Christ again because they backslid two days after. And then someone else comes and repeats and we are reporting the numbers but we lack the wisdom to understand that no one gives birth to children and leaves them in the hospital. We don't have a system of retention and equipping and raising and deploying. And so we remain very gifted, very anointed, and very limited at the same time. <clears throat> very gifted, very anointed, very limited. Why? For lack of wisdom. How does this connect to that? How does this connect to that? How does this connect to that? I don't know if this is going okay or it's not good at all. What's the place of money in ministry? That's a completely different conversation which must be wisdom driven. Because our fathers fought hard And miraculously, they've done really, really well. But maybe God is calling us to do things that if we start putting the money on the table or on the paper, you just look and say, no, 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 please. No, that's it's too expensive. But this, the, the, those resources are available. Heaven has the money. See our fathers, they worked hard. But they didn't build yet, they haven't yet built universities and whole cities. Which other people in other 
countries have done because for them, they were coming, they, they were not establishing in war. Some other people had established for them a little bit. And then they built on that. Yeah. Pastor Deboye is in the founding pastor of the church, RCCG. And yeah, these people, Bishop Oedepo, his spiritual father already had the university and the big church and the international ministry. So you can see that he could start somewhere. Now, how are we thinking? We can't be thinking the same thoughts they thought. Yeah, we can't be fighting the same battles they fought. We have to elevate our thinking to go start somewhere. I was having a conversation with some of our location pastors about some sort of vision I had in my mind yesterday that each of them, their churches could become cities of the Lord wherever they're established. Yeah, so that is like wherever you are, that's the reference point for the whole community of Ah, oh, where are you going? Okay, yeah. Reference point. Where it's like, there is, you, you, regard, whatever God gives you, you set up a place which is like a city. It's like everything is there. Commerce is there. Health facilities are there. Education facilities are there. Yeah? What else? Churches are there. It is see. And... If you think the way they used to think those days, you think you need to have this expanse of acres and green grass and trees. That Forget that. That's gone. Okay? So right now, you probably are going to start building 20 floors. And somewhere on the... Uh, somewhere up there on the whatever floor, there is a hospital. Up there on whatever floor, there is a, a youth hub. Up there on whatever floor there are indoor games activities people can actually play. That's the new that's the new world. Unless you're going to live and go to the forest somewhere and start afresh where there are no people. So we have to change something. Yeah. And anyway, the main point I'm making is it's through wisdom. What you don't know won't hurt you. It will kill you. It is through wisdom. God-given wisdom to know and that this is how you build a church. Building a church should not be some sort of witchcraft. Where it's like either the wind blew or it didn't blow. You know, there, there has to be some... You know, like how you become an engineer. It, it's a systematic, a doctor. You study this, then you do this, then you do this, then you do this, cost this, 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 this. Then you can treat people. Something like that must exist for the building of the church because it has been done for 2,000 years. You can't do something for 2,000 years and you don't have patterns. Unless the generations that come are too proud, which means they are too stupid, to pick up the patterns of what the other people have done. Elon Musk is doing what he's doing, not because he's a great engineer. He doesn't know much science, as we might think, but he's benchmarking on what the other scientists have done in the last 100 years. I was like, if they could do that in 19, this, these are the possibilities now. There's this guy who can improve it. There's this person, bring them together. Build this, this, that, that. But we keep ignoring the patterns and saying how for us God has spoken to us. And ours is the latest thing. It is the only thing that has ever been like the thing. And no one will ever be able to do it again after you like it before. No, the Bible says everything you see has already been nothing new under the sun. That also is wisdom. Maybe you're here and you've been trying to innovate. You, are, you, you want your Sunday services to be at 3 a.m. Yeah. 
You don't understand why everyone has theirs at 10. Like 10 a.m., that's too religious. Me, I want 3 a.m. <clears throat> then we'll ask you for the numbers, and it's even you yourself, you dodge your own service sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the congregation. Because you put at a time when people are sleeping. I don't know whether this is helping. But pastors, why are you looking at me like that? Are you trying to scare me? Okay. So through wisdom. Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. And it says, therefore get wisdom. I think that's Proverbs. What? Four. And in all your getting, get understand in all in all you're getting so I, my prayer for us pastors is that we will get wisdom to build the house of God yeah another funny thing about wisdom hmm. wisdom Acquisition of wisdom is a humbling experience because God brings it through other people. <laughs> yeah, like you have to humble yourself and, and read someone else's book. Or if you are the kind of person who's like me, I only do what God speaks to me directly about. You're going to continue with your 13 people, you grow all together. I hope you don't turn the church compound into a cemetery. It's like Fenaba Little Zika one. <laughs> yeah. Wisdom evades the proud. Yeah. Those who say, I already know. No, for us, everything we've done, we, look, we had a group of 30 people just this morning visiting us from Kenya visiting our church. They came early for transform because they want to visit everything and learn from it. From another country, people took a bus. Another church, they are coming, a hundred of them. But everything they are trying to learn from us, we've learned from someone else. So when I tell the story, I can tell, I, I tell them, this one, this was the person. This one, this was the person. This one, this was the person. Uh, not, nothing original. Zero. I'm not interested in being an original. I'm interested in fulfilling the Great Commission. Yeah. So for you, you are there. Your thing is squeezing you because you don't want to say, I learned this from Apostle Abel Collins. I learned this from Pastor James. I learned. The other one said, May the Lord spoke to me because it sounds so spiritual. Yeah. I was on the mountain where the Lord came to me and saith unto me, My servant James, get up and I speak to thee. I said thus unto thee, Goest thou and no, please. It is people. We just copy other people. Yeah. And do you know how we know who to copy? The ones who have succeeded. The ones with results. Oh, yeah. Some of us, we like to copy people with a lot of words. When you copy people with words, you also have many words. <laughs> yeah. They'll say, on a yogeranga gundi, ya kuogera, but. Yeah. Let me the video. A green leaves, fig tree. No fruit. So we must get into this thing called learning from other people. Copying. I copy everything. Recently we were in Ghana and I met a young man there who is leading this church. Five year old church. But they have 20 churches already. Yeah, and he's aiming to have a hundred by June next year. And I said, what a shock. 
So I asked him, what's going on? What have you done? He said, you know, I used to have miracle services every Friday and people would come. Huh? Bring the sick, the lame, that, and they... That. Okay, he didn't speak Luganda. I'm just trying to interpret for those from Busabala. <laughs> so he said, the things were going well. Huh? He would do but then he noticed the church wasn't what? Growing. Growing or multiplying. He would have these powerful services. People, once they get healed, they go. They go back to their church where they came from. Or somewhere. And then he said, God told him to stop those meetings. And to start that same Friday night to train leaders. Every Friday. So I asked him, what do you call it? He so said, I have what I call the leaders camp night. And he said, we start at 7, end at 11, and the leaders camp night has produced those 20 churches and is going to produce another. <laughs> While I was still in Ghana, I texted the people at home and told them that that other service we are having for praying for the sick, what, what, we call it night of hope, postponed. Leaders camp night. Yeah, I came back. Our first leaders camp night had an attendance from different places of about 1,000, what? 1,800 people. Yeah, category. You're going to first come back, call for a committee meeting, figure out how to call it another name so that it doesn't sound like you copied someone else. And then, we, come on, give us a break. So I, I, when he told me, I knew, I knew. The next day when I found him, I was, I, I was, I, I, I'm going to do leader. I want your permission to use the name leaders company. I said, no, of course. I said, oh, finish it. Man, the last leaders company on Friday, I was teaching about tithe. Yeah. Even if you know that you, are, you know how to teach about tithe to your church, just go and, yeah, yeah. Ask your members to listen to it. You will see what's going to happen. Hey. They, I was accused of serving cassava with black tea with no sugar. Now that's the meal I was serving that day. No salt on the cassava. <laughs> cassava without salt, black tea without sugar. That was leaders camp night, this last one. <laughs> oh yeah. We should we should have miracle services. That one, we also have to have it. Because this business of uh, continuing to talk, talk, talk with no miracles is not good for the church. Yeah, yeah. We'll hand over to the next generation a dead thing if we are not careful. So, insist on praying for the sick until something happens. Yeah, that, 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 that should take that. Yeah, that's one of the things our fathers want. Now we shouldn't go back in reverse, and then the next generation are like, well, but the Bible says the sick get healed, but we never saw it in our church. Mercy. Amen. Amen. Where were we? <laughs> Coping. Leaders camp night. Wisdom comes from people. You see, I got the wisdom of leaders camp night from that man. Now the results I'm going to reap from leaders camp night. It's going to be multiple churches planted at a very high speed. Yeah. You, you will still be here thinking about what to do. Me, I will be planting churches. God bless you as you think about what to do. I'm not into thinking about what to do. Never spend too much time thinking about something someone else has done and succeeded. You're wasting time thinking. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you are to improve it, you can't improve a, a, a thing you have not done. First do the one you've had, then improve it later with your own thinking. Okay. Are we okay? Apostle, 
am I following the, the program properly? Or am I saying things I was not allowed to? Okay. I have to keep checking. I'm not the host. So, <clears throat> that thing there, friends, we are going to go far. We are going to go far. Learning, 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 and implementing. Amen. Now, what, uh, in terms of wisdom, there are a few things which, when you look at the scripture, they seem to be consistent in, in, in the church, in the life of Jesus, the life of the apostles, in establishing ministry and growth, right? And those in the mentorship, we've talked a lot about these things, like praying, preaching, which is evangelism, pastoring, which is discipleship, and planting. So, I'll try and talk about that in, in a way. Now, before that, recently I added another P. You know, I'm, I'm trying to write a book for these things. And that is passion. Passion, okay? Because before they start anything, Jesus gives them the vision in uh, Acts 1.8. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now, let's start there. Let's start there. The, the passion, the vision. We get the first problem which is probably the biggest problem we have right now in this room, is that the majority of the people in this room are not aiming to take their churches to the end of the earth. Actively. It could be a nice thought, but you're not there thinking, this church here, whether you are the one who founded it or you, someone handed over to you, you are not there actively thinking. It's not how you pray. No. You are not thinking we must have a, a branch which, what is your church? Wadim Pamin Church. Which one? Wadim Pamin Church. Wad Wad Empowerment Church. Hey! hey. I feel the empowerment coming on. Where is it based? Kula Ambiru. Hey! What a shock! Kula Ambiru. Yes. Mukulike Akafufu. I need that. But in a tamak. Mabe. So, like, my brother here. I've just met you, so I don't know. But I'm saying, ordinarily, in this meeting, he should be thinking about the next 5,000 not members, churches of Word Empowerment Church. Because if he's not thinking that, who is thinking it? Who is thinking about it? I, first, as are we together? Like, that's the biggest problem right now. All the people in this room, not all, but many people in this room are not actively thinking and praying about this church shall be found in Mozambique. In Jamaica, in India, in UAE, in Germany, in Canada, in Nigeria, in Egypt. Friends, if we are not thinking those thoughts, we are not thinking the thoughts of Jesus. When Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, that instruction was not only to the first church. 
Otherwise, even the one of receiving the Holy Spirit, we should restrict it to the first church. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Let's leave it for only the people who are in the upper room. If we don't want the rest of the instruction in the verse. Because we want the power, we want the Holy Spirit, we want the gifts, we want the tongues, we want the prophecy, we want the healing power. We want everything except the thing for which the thing was given. It's like you want the car, but you don't want to drive it where it was given you to drive it to. What was the point of receiving the, 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 the Holy Spirit? To be witnesses in what scope? Uh, uh, in stages. Jerusalem, that's Kulambiro. Judea, that's your district. That will be General Kampara name. I don't know if you are from here. Samaria, that's the rest of Uganda. And then ends of the earth is outside. Different laws that govern how you do operate there. Who is thinking for your church? Pastor, which is your church? Catching God Ministries. Catching God. We gotta catch God. Hey, where is it based? We are in Chirabulindo. Chirabulindo. Ah, are you related with some people I know? Hmm. Uh, so this one, this way, this one, that way. Now, catching God. Huh? We want to hear catching God. Chireka. Catching God. Bulenga. Catching God. Bugorobi. Kawempe. Entebe. Let me tell you people, you might think that there are many churches. There are not enough churches. They are where too many sinners. Let me tell you. If only 20% of Kampala got saved and decided to go, an extra 20% and decided to go to church, there would be no space. Yeah, there would be no space. There would be no room. You, have you ever seen a traffic jam on Sunday morning? Why aren't our churches causing a traffic jam on Sunday morning? Because all the sinners are sleeping. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. We must do this. Let me tell you. So, we, every time we meet, and they ask you about your new church plant. Don't, don't get annoyed. Because that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit. To be witnesses in increasing measures from wherever you are. Now don't say Jerusalem. Your Jerusalem is where you are. Kulambiro is his. Yours is Bulindo. There must be a Judean version of your church. Where are the Judean churches of your church? And don't say in Entebbe, Pastor B. Collins is there. You, you think Pastor B. Collins is going to be able to take all of Entebbe? Do you know why Uganda is ranked number two in drinking in the whole world? Drink alcohol. We are the second most alcoholic country in the world. Do you know why? It's obvious. How many bars do you drive past between your home and your workplace? 
Now, if you go to Nairobi, people who have a lot more money than us, by the way, <laughs> bars are not easy to find. Yeah, they are, in, they are very organized places, in nice whatever. They don't like, you well, know, duka, kuduka, umbrella, 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 umbrella. <laughs> so do you know what we are going to do? To turn the story around? We should copy our drunkards. They have already shown us what to do. Umbrella, umbrella, catching God, the worship of the wonders, bitch. Yeah. You should not be able to escape us. You escape this one, Oguamori. You escape that one, Oguamori. You don't want English. The other ones are in Luganda. You don't want Luganda, there is Runyankore. You don't want Runyankore, there is Luo. You don't want Luo, there is Lusoga. Yeah. That's what we are going to do. Let our drunkard show us the way. Since we can't think for ourselves. Yeah, they have succeeded in making our, our whole country a drunk country. Number two in the whole world. Even with our poverty, we have money to drink alcohol. Why? It is right there. Yeah, you don't have to go far. Wow. What is your passion? Do you have a Judean version of your church? And after Judea, do you have a Samaria version? If I sit and I tell you. I read the book by Bishop Doug, A Thousand Micro Churches. It fired me up. He was saying that if you plant a thousand churches of a hundred people each, you're going to get way ahead of the game than someone trying to have 5,000 people in one place. Go now, you look at uh, Apostle Abekoins, all the suffering he has gone through just to expand here from the 50 by 100. There is a limit. Even if you want to believe God like how there is this limit to the size of structure you can put here. So sometimes the only way your church is going to grow, which seems to be the dominant way in the scriptures, is to multiply it. Guys, let's go multiply until everyone has a headache. Because you know, if you have only one or two or three, ten ministries trying to do this thing, it's very easy to attack them and silence them. That's why you shouldn't believe everything you hear about people. There is an agenda to, to what's the word? To discredit the witness. If I discredit the witness, that's it. The message is no longer going to come through. But if there are many of us multiplying many churches, look, they will try to figure out who to attack and they can't find. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine if each one here planted, if church, every church here had 1,000. If you have a thousand micro churches, that's a hundred thousand people. That's a very strong church. Do you know a hundred thousand people? A <laughs> hundred thousand people are a lot of people. That's a very strong church. You can swing an election in any constituency at a local level. So passion, that's the first thing. We must multiply the church. Bishop Dad, even though his church is big and they have all these big churches, he was asked, what's the average size of your churches? And he said, the average size of a church in the world is 70 people. He didn't directly answer the question. 
But the average size of a church in the world is 70 people. Now, they are building in northern Ghana 500 churches, buildings. 500 church buildings in one region of Ghana. They have an archbishop whose almost only role is to, to, to open those churches, like, you know, officially open. <laughs> yeah. It, because that's that from morning to evening. <laughs> Opening churches. And on Good Friday this year, they started a campaign on 250 of them, and they already have gone past halfway. Of the 500, the last time I checked, they had done like 300 something. These are small churches of nine meters by 18, permanently built, finished. With the floor, walls, windows, roof, painted, yeah. And they are doing it at $10,000 per, per church. They figured out how to do it in $10,000. Wow. Speed. Speed. Yeah. Because you say, you know, He said, uh, these churches are, are challenging the mosques in northern, Uga in northern Ghana. They've taken note of them. Because they thought they are the only ones who could build at that rate. But, hey, now that's one church. How about if we to quite a one more? You, you go bang it here, what? And someone else is multiplying. Someone else is my plan. So anyway, passion. That's the first thing. If we are going to have the wisdom to build the church of Christ, the first thing we must embrace is his vision for the church. His vision for the church is not for you to be in one place. One place is nice. You get to know everyone. You control everything. You tell them to reduce the volume when you want. You, you, but that's not what he had in mind. Are we, are we together? Yes. Jethro comes to Moses and Moses is doing ministry in a bad way and tells him the thing you're doing is not good. Exodus 18. And he says what you should do is divide up the people. So he told him three things. One, pray to God and bring the people's problems to God, which is praying. Two, uh, teach the people the way they should live and the work they must do. So one is prayer, the other is teaching. And then three, I wish they could find me that thing in Exodus 18. The, th the third one was to choose able men, okay? And make them rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Exodus 18. Maybe if I, huh? <clears throat> Exodus 18. Can we start at the teaching, the praying part? Eh? I'm really just trying to say the same things that, because you know, it's not different. It's the same thing. It's the same things. H has it come? Exodus 18, verse what? Banang, Pastor Chris. Totally not better. Mm -hmm. Verse 19. Okay, start at verse 17 so that we are together. 18, 17. Uh, is someone being blessed by this? Or, or you're thinking, or you're thinking, or you're saying, oh no, I shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have. You know, there are things you hear and you're like, I shouldn't have come. Because now you cannot unhear it. Yeah, you can't erase it from your brain. <laughs> Pastor Arthur. <laughs> yeah. 
You can't unhear it. 18, oh, 1817. You hear it and you're like, mm. and please don't say, oh, that's the grace of God on worship harvest. God doesn't selectively distribute his grace. Otherwise, it ceases to be. Uh -huh. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, together, the thing that you do is not good. What was he doing? He was sitting there from morning and everyone was coming to one man for ministry. Am I describing your church or something? Don't put up your hand if I'm describing your church. You are the one. Sunday, this, that, Tuesday counseling. They all come to you. You are like Moses. The only difference is you had the number of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, about two million. He didn't have to do evangelism. They were all Israelites. Now you, you're there trying his method. You don't, even, you don't even know he says it's not good. Anyway, so he said the thing that you do is not good. So look at your uh, pastor and sitting next to you. Look at them carefully and see if perhaps they are the kind that Sit there and wait for every member to come to them for ministry. Why aren't you looking at just um, first look? You're, you'll not know if they are the kind without looking. Now, some people are fearing some people. Some people don't want to look. Just look, and if you suspect that they might be doing that, tell them the thing that you do is not good. And what did he say? Both to you and these people, let's read, who are with you will surely wear yourselves out for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Okay. Next verse. Listen now to my voice. I'll give you counsel and God will be with you. Ah, you see that? I'll give you counsel. God will be with you. Sometimes you're looking God for God in all the wrong places. And it's in the counsel you're receiving. Yeah. You do something someone told you and it works. Your church grows and you're like, but where was God all this time? Yeah. <laughs> and if you are too big-headed to listen to counsel, you keep wondering, where is God? Where is God? Anyway, let's go. I'm just trying to get out of the way so everyone can read. Uh -huh. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. That's prayer. I hope you are already convinced about this. You cannot even hire people to pray for you, even if you had money. But for me, my intercessory team is on staff, <coughs> paid. Retainer. Where do you work? The other church. Murimochi. Ndi Musabi. Ndi Mwega Irizi. Wow. Guess who prayed for himself and didn't have uh, a prayer team? Jesus. What a shock. With all that anointing, he wouldn't get people to pray for him. Mm. The prayer team, the, the one time he asked them to stand with him, they slept. <laughs> you be there thinking people are praying for you. <laughs> you, you think they are praying for you. Anyway, I'm praying for you. If you think they are praying for you, I'm praying for you. You are lifting me up in prayer. Thank you. Uh, wow. What a shock. So prayer. And you know among pastors, when you talk about prayer, 
The way they look at you, they make you look redundant. You're like, what are you talking about? This is who I am. I am Mr. Prayer. What? Prayer is me and I am prayer. You'll be there trying to make me look idle when I'm talking about prayer. I know pastors. Yeah. We are too busy. Yeah. To pray. Too busy to pray. Yeah, I'm talking about myself. Prayerless pastor. Just too much strategy. This, 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 that. No prayer. Look, I had to learn how to pray. I'm still learning. Up to now, the distractions are too much. And too many, okay. Even, uh, even much can work. <laughs> okay, too many. <laughs> so, you, pray, praying is not obvious for a pastor. And the worst thing, you know like those people in church, who, like those sisters in church, who are the ones you least expect to be fornicating. Hmm? Yeah, like from the way they testify and sing in the choir and, and fall down when, when the Holy Spirit has come. They are the one... Uh, uh, and the length of their skirts. It is a, even nothing. Even if they wanted, someone wanted to accuse them, you'd be like, it's not possible. Guy, you don't know. Why are pastors looking at me like that? Are you claiming there are no fornicators in your church? Or you don't you can't even tell them who they are? <laughs> you bring me to your church, I'll I'll tell you. Now <laughs> I know your good parents. Every parent eh, thinks they are children, eh? They are the best. They can't even kill a fly. But I can tell you, unless your church has like seven people and you know them very well. Yeah, I have seen things. Yeah, I used to think this is worship purpose. We are special. We are God's children. We have understood the grace of God. There are things that we don't do. My friend, they bring you reports. You'll be like, cut you or no? What's this? You know, like those days, all the bad people used to be from KPC. Yeah. Do you know why? Because it is a big church. You see, the only reason your church doesn't have bad people is because it's... <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I'm telling you. When your church is... <laughs> When your church is small, it's very easy to manage the behavior of people. When you're a big church with thousands of people. Wow. wow. One time I got a call from a reverend, a very good friend of, not even a friend, he's like a father. He was inquiring about a member of ours who had not shown up for a kwanjula. Yeah, he was supposed to be being Kwanjulad. Apparently, this member had gone to their church and uh, and proposed to the Sunday school teacher, and they are dated. Now it was time for Kwanjula, and afterwards the wedding would be in a week's time, and the fellow had disappeared. Now he had signed in, said he's from worship what? Harvest. My God. We looked for the fellow. I asked all the elders, all the ushers. I, I said, what location? When they said, which location? I said, I, I contacted everyone at that. Have you ever had this name? What This person? What? Yeah. You see, when you become a, a big church, even people who don't belong to churches, they will go somewhere and sign up that they are from your church. Yeah, that's what KPC used to suffer from. Oh, yeah. All the wrong fellows were from KPC because anyone could claim to go to yeah. KPC because it's a big oh, they, church. They 
church. Yeah, the renowned church. Now you know one claims to come to your church. So, they say, they say, they say, they say, they say, they say, One cow which goes and eats the neighbor's things. They will say, that man's cows, they eat uh, people's things. Yeah. Ah. Uh, where were we? Stand before... What, what, what was that talking about? Yeah, I was talking about fornicators. <laughs> yeah, with the long skirts. And on the worship team. So you can't tell. Oh yeah. Because they are in front. Yeah, because you don't expect someone on the worship team to be a fornicator. Especially the way they cry when they are singing. <laughs> That's <a sadistic. laughs> now, likewise, so likewise, you know how sometimes you can be shocked when a couple who have always looked like they are most in love, more in love than anyone else, <laughs> when they come with problems, you're like, but I thought, how, how is it possible? It can't be this couple having issues. Because when they are at church, they are like, what? <laughs> uh, are there any pastors? Is this a meeting for pastors? Or am I talking to administrators only? Oh, yeah. Baby, I couldn't know they're in love. Kumbe. They have issues. And you see, the more people try to show they are in love in public, the more you should be careful. Not suspect, but be careful. Because it's like, why? Why the need to? Why try so hard? Okay? So, so that's a problem with pastors. Everyone thinks we are prayerful. Because our title is our cover for prayerlessness. Yeah, no one would expect that there is anyone in here who hasn't prayed today. <laughs> yeah, you would be suspect. That in a, a pastor's meeting, there is a man or woman of God here who hasn't taken any time to talk to God today. They haven't read their Bible. They haven't prayed. But they are here in a pastor's meeting. <laughs> who would expect? What a shock. Yeah. Your members. <laughs> this is not good. Eh? <laughs> Your members, your prayer life, eh? whatever it is, add two hours. That's what your members think. I'm telling you, you, you just do a survey without people putting names. How long do you think I pray? How long? Just tick the right amount of time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially when you are the one who taught in the prayer in a series on prayer. So, if you pray one hour, <laughs> what? <laughs> they think you pray ezo per day. Oh yeah. If you pray. Two hours. 
they think you are praying four. If you pray three, they think you pray five. If you don't pray at all, they know mark minimum two hours the man of God is in the is in the is in is in the closet. Minimum two hours. Yeah. Because the way the word of God comes forth in the service. Yeah. That that comes from somewhere. I'm telling you. Uh huh. Every time they call you and you're not, your phone is not on. They know. They just they just see you on your face down like this. That's what the picture in their, in their mind. <laughs> yeah. Interceding for them. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's why when they give birth, mwe bale kusaba, mwe bale kusaba, kuliko mwan, mwe bale, mwe bale kusaba musumba. They know you prayed. I have been while you're waiting for your prayer partners to cover you. <laughs> Who is annoyed? Who are some people looking annoyed by my message? <laughs> bring the bring stand before God for the people. Yeah. Elijah said, as long as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years until I say so. Before whom I stand. If you don't get into prayer, you will think that Pastor Arthur or Timia is the only one authorized to perform miracles. Or you'll think that your church has to have miracle in it for the miracle to happen. You can even have miracle in it. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. Our church was a miracle-free church for a long time. When the miracles happened, there were few and far between. In fact, they did a documentation to prove that there had ever been a miracle. Wow. Yeah. Do you know why? Prayerless pastor. So I know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Meanwhile, if you found me, you would never think that I'm prayerless. Oh, yeah. In fact, nowadays I look so prayerless. You would never think I pray. Yeah. But those days you would think I pray, but I wasn't. So because I wasn't praying, I wasn't making altar calls. You know, that's how you know someone is praying. They don't make altar calls because altar calls are dangerous. Yeah. You can be there. They, they raise the key. They raise the key again. No one is coming. <laughs> you change the song. Why is no one coming? Because the, the power to convict people, it's not there. It's not there. Mm. I'm telling you. So, people don't want me to continue. Who says the things you're talking about now, you should skip? Because these ones, we have read, uh, this, this is level of righteousness, we have surpassed it. We are pastors. Anyone saying I should go? Okay. Next. Next verse, please. Verse 20. Bless God for verse 20. Uh, amen. Thank you, Lord. For verse 20. Oh. Oh. It's coming. It's coming. I thought it would be nice for people to see it so that they know I'm not forging. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. 
The second thing is teaching. Teaching. Remember, we are talking about the wisdom to grow a church. If you, if you treat me nicely, I'll go back to that Proverbs 24 and show you something, which I wanted to show you, but I didn't show you at that time. But if you, are, if you want, I can show you. This man is my neighbor, so if he says I show you, I show you. <coughs> okay. I'll show you. Now, verse 20, it says, teach them. So the second thing is teaching. Discipling. Equipping, Right? Teach, 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 teach. There is not enough teaching. The people must be taught. The Bible says they continue to stay fast in the apostles' doctrine, which is the apostles' teaching and fellowship. Right? They continued steadfastly. Teaching is major. Go beyond the excitement of preaching and teach. Mm. Teach the people. And I learned from Bishop Doug that much of the teaching we do is too, we teach like British schools. Eh? How we, you know how we all went to school here in Uganda. And you have all this theory, but they tell you to the thing there, you can't do it. Dr. Woon, she can tell us how things are, they are trying to change now. Even the British changed, but for us, we stuck to their thing. Hey, Master Musa, this Empire of Dahomey, what? Oba, what? Saskatchewan, swinging pendulum. Until they tell you, okay, fix this thing with the knowledge you acquired in school. Like, no, 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 no. Me, I was studying to pass the exam, not to do anything. So we, we, we've taken that way of teaching and we've brought it into church. We teach thing, people very high things. Mysteries, exciting stuff. Yeah. The broomstick of Jehu. The meaning of the four horses. It is Meanwhile, a person barely knows how to treat their wife. <laughs> barely. We, they have no clue. What a shock. So I learned from Bishop Doug a new method of teaching. Don't, don't speak to giraffes. Feed the sheep. Many of us are speaking to giraffes. Very high things. The sheep are down here looking up and saying, Hey, those leaves, when are we going to eat them? <laughs> Teach basics. Do you know the most basic teacher in the Bible? Jesus. <clears throat> if they tell you to carry the thing one mile, carry a second mile. Like, what, what is there to be confused about that? <laughs> if they ask for your coat, Give them the, the tunic as well. You're looking for a deeper meaning, meanwhile. Uh, that's the meaning. That's it. Give them. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Jesus' teachings, they are just interesting. Love your neighbor. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Love your enemies. And you're like, please, give me something to do with, you know, the third heaven. Take me deep. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. It says you tax collectors. Don't collect more than what is due. You're looking for the depth. It's not there. <laughs> ah, he left. <laughs> uh, uh, am I making sense? So teach people from the scriptures... But teach. Like when you teach about prayer, like when I teach about prayer, I even teach the one hour thing. From Bishop Doug. Teach one hour. Pray if you are going to be an effective prayer person. Pray one hour. Because Jesus said, couldn't you stand with me even one hour? What? Couldn't you watch with me one hour? So one hour is the expectation of Jesus. Yeah. 
to put some music because silence is too slow. So you don't pray in the bed, you sleep. Like you have to teach everything, rising up a long while before daylight. He got up, got out, departed to a solitary place there. He prayed. That's a process. Teach the whole thing. Now you go to the people, pray, pray. And they're like, what is that? Yeah, tap into the depth. You know, when you teach like that, then they can't teach it to someone else. Yeah. Deep calls today. The, you have to teach in a way where someone has to be able to teach another person. Yeah. So keep it simple. Hmm? Tithe. Keep it simple. This is how you do it. This is how you practice genocide. This is what you do. Do this for your parents. Do this for your wife. Do this for your husband. Do, do you teach? Don't borrow. Don't conceptualize the borrowing. Don't, don't. So anyway, yeah. So teaching them the work, the way, and the work. The work and the work. The way, the work and all. Three. I must finish this part because I really want to show you something. Ah, verse 21. <clears throat> Moreover, you shall select from other people. Uh-huh. Able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hate in covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Now, quickly, how do you select able men? So they have to have some leadership capacity. Hmm? Paul said, if they can't even lead at home, eh? please, don't bring them to lead at church. So pastors, what, mostly what we do, all the people with leadership capacity, we tell them, you go and make the money and bring. And then you recruit only those who can manage to barely walk and chew gum, and you surround yourself with them. And that forms your leadership team. Ah. Able men. Would you describe your leaders as able? <clears throat> Able men and women. From here, I've added women. That's my part. But we we'll describe them as able. Can they carry the weight? So one, there has to be ability to lead. It can't be anyone. Not everyone has ability to lead. Two, men who fear God. Ha, this is very complicated, but I'm... I don't have, I'm not going to give you the detail. Let me give it to you as it is. If you're the pastor hmm, and they don't fear you, they don't fear God. Where does God live? Yeah, because everyone can pretend to fear God because he's not around. Yeah. Oh, me, I fear God. Me, I fear God. <laughs> May God give you eyes to see all the liars and see through them like up to the one thousandth liar. And you just be praying for mercy for them. Yeah, just mercy only. Because, you know, church can be full of stupid people. Yes. Yeah. Who, who think that you, because you chose to be a pastor, your, your brains failed. That's why you chose pastoring. Oh. Hmm. When Peter, when Ananias was about to die, what did Peter tell him? Why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? Was Ananias speaking to the Holy Spirit? Uh, and what else did he tell him? <laughs> you have not lied to men, but to God. 
You are deceiving me, but you are deceiving God. Because you are deceiving a person who is full of the, uh, the Holy Spirit, who is God. Or you are those ones who think that what comes out of your tap is not water. It's until you go to Lake Victoria that it qualifies to be water. Let me continue. If they don't fear you, they don't fear God. Never appoint them. Yeah. But they have money. They did this. I don't, I'm not impressed by any of that. And I hope you are not. Too. Even you, let me, let me, let me turn it on us. You think you're a pastor and you fear God. Who do you fear in your life? Who is it who, if they texted now, you would be trembling? If you don't have a person like that in your life, you don't fear God. Yeah, you don't fear God. In your mind, you think you fear God, but you don't fear God. Yeah, because you don't fear the people in whom God is. Okay, <clears throat> let me go back to my text. I think I'm, yeah, the people this side don't like what I'm saying. Yeah, <clears throat> such as fear God. How do you know they fear God? They, they, they have reverence for people that God has put in place to lead them. Minus that, forget it. Men of truth. <clears throat> Men of truth. They are people of truth and they are people of the word. Hating covetousness. That's the most complicated, probably less complicated than the fear of God part. But how do you measure hating covetousness? It's by generosity. Yeah. By generosity. If you ever get a non-generous person and put them on your leadership, you're finished. Because where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. People are not generous. Their heart is not with the ministry. Never follow talkers. Talk. Everyone can talk. Just show me your tithing record before you can converse. Oh, yeah. It's as straightforward as that. If you don't like it, there are too many churches go down the road. There's one there, up the road, there's the other one there. Why should you st be stuck here where you are? we are not going to give you responsibility because we are insisting on you being a certain way? Jesus said, if you have not been faithful with unrighteous mammon, who will commit you the true riches? So it's a foolish pastor who commits to, to people, people, to a person, people who are the true riches, who is not faithful with unrighteous mammon. Now let's come to this other thing. Place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens. Simple question. In your church, who are the rulers of thousands? <laughs> who are the rulers of thousands? Who are the rulers of hundreds? Who are the rulers of fifties? And who are the rulers of tens? <laughs> tens and fifties. Uh, I like it. You have to start somewhere. Yeah. Now you see pastors. There is one other pressing thing I want to talk about, but allow me first get stuck here. Because I keep talking about it, but people don't seem to get it. But the people, the few people who have got it, ah, the testimonies they have. Your church has to be what the politically incorrect word, which even if you are watching online and you want to think evil things about me, I don't care. Is it has to be militarized. 
Oh, some people, there are people who have a problem with everything. Militarized. It has to be organized into a rank, a ranked church with a military type structure. Because only militaries take territory. Civilians don't. If you have a civilian church, you can't take territory. So your church has to be re reorganized into a military structure. Rulers of thousands. Who are those? In our church, conceptually, those are location pastors, pastors of locations. Rulers of hundreds, those are our zonal pastors. Rulers of fifties, those would be what we call called shepherds. It's sort of a silent leadership thing there, but it's there. And then rulers of tens, those are the mission of community leaders. Do you have them in your church? Are they are rankings? Because you can't take territory if you are the only one there and everyone else is a civilian. You are the, the general with no soldiers. You have members. A general with members. So they are coming for their membership rights. You, you are telling them to go do evangelism. They'll be like, oh, I'm so mommy, I can be able to settle in this church. I was tired of suffering at my former church. Now you are telling me to go and do evangelism. Now, there is a balance to these things. If you go all out military, people will leave you because they didn't come to join a military organization. They came to be shepherded. It's a family. So that's what Mike Brin calls a family on mission. So a huge part of your church ministry should be just family. Care. You're a shepherd. You have sheep. So you have to understand these concepts in your, in your head. Take care of people, feed the sheep, care for the sick, feed the hungry, do everything, visitations, etc. Then at the other side of your church is mission. That's why God is both a father and a king. What he does as a father is not what he does as a king. The king side of God is as real as the father side of God. And you are his representative on both sides. So, figure it out. So, some people only go on the father side. They have the most loving, lovey-dovey environment ever. But they are not going anywhere. That church is going to be in one place. And they will grow all together. They just add a few members. Then others, it is maje, 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 maje. Everything is a drill, a training, a what? <laughs> People are like, this is too much. They are just short of wearing uniform. <laughs> so there is no love. So it's a combination of both, right? You understand it. But really what I wanted to bring to, to light is what is, what this, take this scripture by the way and just take it as it is and execute it in your church. You'll be amazed. Do you have rulers of tens? If your church is still a uh, hundred members, you can't have rulers of thousands yet. So you need to have rulers of tens. As you grow, you need to have rulers of fifties. As you grow, you need to have rulers of hundreds. As you grow, you plant and get start getting rulers of thousands. Maybe I should take some questions at this point and then I, I'm going to come back and talk briefly about money, the money side of things. Is, is that okay? No, but let me just show you one more thing before you start. Uh, Proverbs 24, verse 3 and 4. Uh -huh, through wisdom, a house is built. By understanding it is established. Wisdom will help you build the church 
Understand it will help you establish the church where it is no longer movable, whatever. And, and that includes having your own property. And having a place like this where you shall no longer be oppressed by the evil one. Yeah, yeah it's your place. The padlocks are yours. The doors are yours. The building is yours. You are established. You, no one can wish you away. Now, the last part says that, uh, next verse, by knowledge. Uh, the what? Are filled. With all? No, this is just, just jalibu, you know, bonus. Eh? Like those things, this is the ice cream of the meal. Eh? So the first one is the rooms. So how many rooms does your church have? Don't get annoyed. I'm just asking a question from the verse. It's large. It's large. <laughs> One large room. It, say, it doesn't say the large room. It says the rooms. So you can interpret this different ways. Like at one place, you can have a room for the adults, a room for the children, a room for the teens. It is, but another way to interpret this is to have many locations, many churches. Yeah. His church has a room in Bukaya, a room. In Buryankuyege, a room. In Chiriowa, a room. In Kalido, a room. In Washitaka. He always chooses these interesting villages. Like, who, how can you go to a place where Buryankuyege? Ivukula. That's the one that makes you laugh. <laughs> yeah, Ivukula. Yeah, real places. So, the rooms. But I need rooms. Not just Vulindo. We need rooms. The rooms. A room in Arua. A room in Bujiri. A room in Wera. The rooms. Your church must have rooms. That's the pattern of Jesus. In my father's house, there are many mansions. Yeah, you don't just build one good thing and you st you're stuck there. Ah, people here don't want this discussion. Oh, but why are you looking at me like you don't want it? What a shock. I challenge you to go and organize many, many rooms in many countries for the church that goes by the name God gave you to call your church. You are not alone. I'm also not going to feed our call. Oh, yeah. To have rooms in different places. It's like, this one is there. Yeah, now, the last part is, you know, it's also nice, but yeah, it says the rooms are filled with precious, unpleasant riches. Now, I don't want to waste more of your time. Uh, riches in the kingdom are people. So the rooms, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is one thing having the rooms. It is another thing for the rooms to be filled with the thing that is pleasant and precious to God, which is people. Okay, I, I can see that some of you want it. Some of you probably are wondering whether you want it. You be here. The day you have 1,000 built churches full of people, I hope you'll still be talking to us. The security is Yeah, I'm telling you. Something will change. Even you will not have intended. You might be here very humble and you're like me, I can never be like You wait. You first do it and then we we'll see if you can never be like that. You don't know why people have, some of you just complain that people have guards. You don't know why they have guards. Do you know why they have, have guards? Yeah. It, 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 no, no, it might be that for you, the river at which you operate, you don't need guards. No one is trying to harm you. 
You haven't done enough damage to the devil. Some people need guards. Okay. I, I, whether you like it or not, you don't, just don't be there having opinions about things you don't know. Yeah. I get guards. <laughs> first, first get the rooms filled. And then you'll, you'll know that I think uh, uh, we might need guards. Anyway. Apostle Bacon, is am I in order? I'm still in order. Okay. Should we take a question or do I go to finances? Can I go to finances? I go, I go. Now, we are trying to build the house. So you plant. If you don't plant, it can't get planted. Yeah. One day you have to wake up and say, this is Rolling Stones, catch no more international ministers of the Holy Ghost fire. I'm the senior pastor and then you start. <laughs> or hopefully someone will send you. It's so much easier when you're sent than when you send yourself. Don't say I didn't tell you. So someone will send you a plant. The next task is to grow the thing. How do you grow the thing? You pray and you do evangelism. And then you disciple those people into maturity and you send them out to do more prayer and more evangelism and you grow the thing and then you multiply it yeah. in other places. You create more rooms. Okay? That's what uh, Apostle Moses Kalanzi has done very successfully in a short time. 13 churches. Now, if you don't have mission or communities or groups, that means you don't have a training ground for leading churches. So you'll be sending people blindly. You look at the person, you see the way they come their hair, and you say, I think this one can be a pastor. Then you send them. They have never tried leading people. The only way they can try leading people is in groups or mission or communities, and later on into zones when you zone the church and you have leaders of hundreds. Makes sense. Yeah, that's how your leaders are proven. So by the time you send the person, they're already experienced with how the church is run because they're helping you run it and taking care of people. Those are the two things, the organization and the organism, which is taking care of people. So, and then you do that, you do that, you do that. Now, one of the limiting factors, when you have everything right, one of the limiting factors is money. Yeah. When you, in your head... I can't you, you know exactly what to do until you go asking for a venue to send your people off a loudspeaker or something. Then they give you some figure and you'll be like, bind you, Jesus. You know, rather bind you, devil. Wow, what a shock. You can even bind the wrong person when, 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 when you're told the wrong money. Yeah. Thankfully, no one can bind Jesus. So money, what do you do? One, understand that there is more money than you need for your mission. Yeah, that's where you start. It doesn't make sense, but it is what it is. Yeah. There's too much money in the world. Can you, when they start listing all these billionaires, you be thinking, what do they do? What do they use their money for? Yeah, the money is there. Too much. Too, too, too much. So you should always operate with an abundance mindset. If you ever let scarcity into your head, you're finished. Yeah, it doesn't matter what you do. State of the leader, state of the church. So first understand there is there are resources. Yeah. And there are a lot. We just don't see them, but there are a lot. There's a lot of money. The people who have an eye for resources just see resources everywhere while the rest you might be thinking as long as you posture yourself as a needy person who needs it's not good 
your heart posture and is, I'm a powerful person who has access to resources. And the only thing left is manifesting those resources. When I was sitting on Friday, I told people what I thought was a revelation that came to me, that everything about the life of Jesus was supernatural, including his resources. We all operate in the supernatural until the money part. Then we move into carnal means. And that never works. Everything about Jesus was supernatural, including money. So there is money. It's available and supernatural. So whatever I'm not seeing in my account is just something I don't know. It's, it's knowledge I don't have. It's not money being absent. Because I think honestly that for God, if there is any miracle he's going to do which is easiest, it's money. So one, be convinced with all your heart that there is more than enough resources. Amen. Amen. Two, having been convinced. Having been convinced. I'm trying to think about how to arrange like quickly three or four or five things that can be helpful without. There is a book, a red book. If you ever get it, read it. It will help you. Essential Practices for Healthy Church Finances. But having been convinced, yeah, practice the principle of, of sowing. As long as earth endures, time, seed, and harvest shall remain. Look, it doesn't matter. That, that thing is eternal. Uh, uh, the, the, only, the, on, the day you wake up and time, seed, and harvest have stopped working, just know you are not on earth. You have gone to another place. Yeah. Yeah. Like the day you go to look in the mirror and you are not there. You go to the mirror and you are not seeing yourself. Just know you are in another realm. Yeah. The body is not there, but you are seeing the mirror. <laughs> so time, seed, and harvest. When we left St. Francis, this is the one thing we learned from our pastor. Tithing the money of the church. It was a student church, but they used to tithe every week. And that church always had money, even though it was full of students. We even built a student center. When we were going to visit a church in a, a first world country, he took uh, money from the church as a gift to the other church. And when we came back, that thing, the, the project moved even quicker because the other church was building. Now, there is nothing that I labor more than trying to convince pastors of this principle because or oh, they be thinking they want me to give their money to worship service. Please don't give it to worship service. Go find someone who you think needs your money and give it to them. Please, the, that's the one thing I can assure you of that I know that works, which doesn't require too much intelligence. You don't need to be an accountant and what, or chivaziza, no. Of all the money that comes into your coffers, give money to other ministries. Yeah. yeah. We've done that from the beginning. When we all we could give was 7,000 shillings. Yeah. Can you imagine sending 7,000 shillings to a church? You have to write a letter to explain. <laughs> yeah, that's how it used to be. It was so embarrassing. Very little, but we kept giving it. Now we give a little bit more. Yeah. What we give can be a blessing to some people. Last year alone, we gave away about a billion shillings to other churches. So, I tell you that not for any reason, but just to tell you that it works. Because our money comes from Uganda, from Ugandans. We don't have too many sources out there. When people come to our church, they think we have Americans who are building our church. Well, no, please. 
Can we to, to them who are To have a lemo. To have a lemo. So practice the principle of sowing. Here's a good thing about the principle of sowing. You can start tomorrow. Yeah, you just go to your accountant or finance manager or admin and say, how much did we collect on Sunday? Write a check of this much to whoever. Everything else I'll tell you will not help you if you don't understand that part. Yeah. It will not help you. you, you and you shouldn't struggle. We shouldn't struggle. But the only part between the harvest and the seed, which part are you in control of? The seed, the seed yeah. You, can, you can't control the harvest. The only part you are in charge of is the seed. If you plant, the harvest will come. So that's two. One was understand there is more than enough money. Two, so seed. Three, save and invest a portion of the church's money. Yeah. Have an account where you send a certain percentage every week as it comes in. Because it will surprise you one day when you check and you see how much will be there. Like right now, if, if I ask you to compile just 10 or 20 percent, I recommend 20 percent as a minimum. If I ask you to compile 20 percent of all the money that you've collected in your church since the year began, you will just you start using the tablecloths as, as whatever, as you weep and clean your, your tears. Because it will occur to you that you will have had enough money to buy a serious piece of land by now, just in one year. If the offering is 120,000, take 24,000, put it in a special account. It never leaves that account unless it is going to, to, to be invested to increase the assets of the church. The Mormons are incredible investors. 100 years ago, they were bankrupt. They filed for bankruptcy. They brought in a team to start investing a portion of their money. They now have assets more than $100 billion. Yeah. They even think that uh, their prophet got an extra book from God. So they, they add other things to the Bible and they're crazy. But they have churches all over the world. Why? Because they have money. I know you want to go and plant in Korea, but please, the money. So that's why we must. So if, if we don't take the money thing seriously, we will not fulfill Jesus' great commission of going to the ends of the earth. Because it's costly. So invest money. Don't be a spendthrift. Don't be people who just spend. Don't be in the, you're the only button you know is spending. So one, mindset. Two, tithing or sowing. Three, saving to invest. Have assets. A day should come and your church owns a good portion of MTN. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, that this church, MTN, Simanyi, the other oil well, uh, I don't know, Airtel, over what petroleum company, you have percentages there. Yeah, that, that's how it should work. And then, you know, if you get to a point and your investments are spewing at you some 100 million shillings a day, you think you will not go plant churches in other countries? To be so straightforward. Yeah. Those are three or four. Three. Four. Organize your expenditure. So what, what is left? So, so let's say you got a hundred thousand. Mm? They put it in a bag. Ten per ten thousand out. Twenty thousand goes to a special account for investment. Now you're left with 70,000. You must know how that 70,000 is spent. It can't be whatever is left. What is it for all? Something for free for all. Whoever has the most convincing argument is the one who takes the most of it. No, it shouldn't be like that. You should have known by now that you spend this percentage on, on salaries or human resource. 
So that is set aside. This percentage on operations, that is set aside. This percentage on this, that is set aside. So when the money comes, it should immediately go to its major expense portions. So that then you are spending from there. Mostly in church, you're going to have, if, if you are a maturing church, you may have staff. So you're going to have human resource. You're going to have operation costs. Those are the two majors. So you, you should be able to separate, to separate, separate those two so that you are not suffering either way. I think those are all I can share for now. Yeah. Apostle Omlimo go on to me and go seven. Can we appreciate the apostle please one more time? I am I am thinking that if we can have like twenty minutes more just for questions. Twenty minutes. Are you guys in a rush? Uh, Apostle, I must tell you, please be seated. Apostle, I must tell you that the number one reason, there may be many reasons, but the number one reason why I love you it is because you share practical wisdom. Practical wisdom. There, there is a dear friend of mine. We went to visit him with another pastor. And then we asked him that, hey, brother, how did you manage to buy this big land? I say, he looked in the heaven like, the Lord, the, the Lord. I, I, I just left him because, look, I am past 21. I need some formulas. <laughs> At least if I can check, I am past 21. Are you getting the point? The reason why we are here, it is because Apostle Mose is sharing with us Formulas. Much together. So, I'm I know Pastor Tim knows that pastor. You know, there are some people over here. But anyway, we are going to get questions from you people. I'm going to ask the guys in there to prepare the microphones. Apostle, I just want to welcome you back to answer the questions. <clears throat> Any questions? I'll try and answer them quick. Thank you, Apostle. It's a blessing to be here. My name is Elijah Bawie. I'm a pastor from Nkumba, Jew of Christ Church. Amen. If I want to, to adopt this kind of wisdom and begin leading the church professionally, because everything you're explaining to us goes into that line. If I want to begin with one staff, that is employed by the church. Mm. What kind of personnel should be and what are the activities we can assign that particular person? We want to begin with one staff in getting into this way of doing things. Thank you. Wow. I would say start with volunteers. There are enough people willing to help. Uh, in any case, if a church is going to have staff and I, I, I think now that the first staff should be the pastor yes. as much as is possible. Yes. Unless maybe the pastor has a job and then maybe they need someone to just do clerical work like an admin. But mostly they use volunteers until a certain size. I usually advise to have about a staff member for maybe 100 people. If you hit 100, you can have a staff member. If you hit 200, you can have two. 303. Not that you keep adding. So like at 3,000, you should have 30. <laughs> but, but, you know, some things you can scale up. But I, I typically discourage having heavy staffing costs because a church in its infancy, staffing should be its most important. It shouldn't be its most important priority. Its most, most important priority should be operations and establishing the church as soon as possible, getting some sort of uh, property or something that secures the future of the church. Yeah. But so, 100, 1, 200, 2, 300, 3. 
Then from there, you start consulting. Yeah. Thank you, Apostle, for the wisdom. My name is Brian Wejuli. I pastor Wells of Life Numa Ministries, uh, Kajansi. My question is about the finances. You talked about tithing. Is there a, a specific uh, spiritual protocol that one should tithe to for it to work? What I mean is, if I give to a church that maybe I think is uh, not well financially, does it work? Or do I have to look for a church which is as well succeeding financially to tithe there for me to have it work? Thank you. Well, thank you. We give to all kinds of churches. We give to churches that are doing well and we give to churches that are not doing well. Uh, we believe that tithe belongs to the Lord and that whoever we give it to, we are giving it to the Lord. And that the Lord is with both the smaller and the bigger. Yeah. Unless, you have, unless you, are, you have a spiritual father and you're a church plant of another church, in which case probably your best uh, choice is to tithe into that church uh, where, which planted you. If you were planted as an integrated church, I would recommend tithing to the church that planted you. And then, but you should still have some money to give out to others. Yeah. Basically, that's what I wanted to ask if um, I'm supposed to tithe to the church that um, I'm answerable to, but I think you have answered it. Yeah, uh, if I, that, that would take first, first precedence, I think. Okay. Yeah. But God is going to give you a lot of resources, some of you to the extent that you will only need to spend less than 50% on your own churches, so don't worry too much about it. You can tithe 10% and still have another 30% to give. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Apostle. Uh, my name is Ronald Saz, Impact Church, Wakiso. Uh, so I'm asking about savings. Is it okay? for a church to take a seed from the saved money. You had us, you... You had us savings and then you take a seed from it? Yes. If God tells you to, uh, the first time we hosted Andrew Mark, we didn't have anything to give him, so we took our savings, which was uh, $1,500, was it? Uh, which was on a Friday. And we gave it to him. It was what we had in the savings. On, on, on Tuesday, the next week, someone brought 46 million as tithe. In a time when our weekly giving used to be around 3 million shillings. So, if God tells you to do something, you do it. Yes, Apostle. For me, mine is a, it's a, it's a compliment of what I'm learning today. Again, each time I come, I sit under you, I'm always being challenged. When you made mention of the fact that we need to do more than our fathers, sometimes we have been kind of making ourselves comfortable, hmm. thinking that we, of course we are doing a lot more than some of them. But then when you look at the challenges, I think you've not been looking well. You look at the challenges that they, they have had, and how they have navigated around the challenges, and you look at the results we have vis-a-vis -vis the kind of environment that we have. I think um, I had never appreciated that much the, the freedom of worship we have, uh, the environment that has been created hmm. by the men that fought. Hmm. Recently, Pastor Kanja was in Impidia, and he made mention of the fact that over 1,000 pastors were arrested during Idi Amin's time. And he was saying that you are here enjoying, you are making noise, but there are men who were put in prison yeah. for the same thing that we are uh, putting, uh, pushing ahead. Mm. Some men had to die because of it. So you re echoed it today, and it really stirred me up. Thank you. Mm. Right, right next year. Uh, oh, and then we'll go. Over. Thank you very much, Apostle. I have also really been blessed by the teaching. And uh, what really stood out for me is about the qualifications of the people to surround yourself with as leaders. 
Um, I have a question mm. on the very first one, able men. Yeah. I think one of the challenges sometimes we have in church uh, is that the able, the most able people are also very busy. Yeah. And the uh, most willing volunteers are not usually very able. Mm -hmm. Could you please so <laughs> comment on that? Thank I you. know. It's, it's complicated, but uh, what I've learned from Bishop Doug is that you reap what you teach. If you hear Bishop Doug teaching, eh? man, if you are in Bishop Doug's church, well, don't you serve? <laughs> you, you are a doctor. You teach in the university, you're a professor, but you're here, aren't you busy? So what, what is different between you and them? The difference between you and them is that for you, you have a conviction to serve, while they think that serving God is, you know, one of those things that I will do God a favor and the pastor when I have time. Yeah, if, if I send my money. So Bishop Doug makes you feel like uh, you're going to hell if you're not serving. <laughs> <laughs> the way he preaches, it's like, oh my, I better go and serve. So I find that for him, very high-ranking people, they are serving. Yeah. yeah, like when we were there for the conference, one of the guys cleaning, uh, Ren, we had some pastors there who were interacting with the guys cleaning between the sessions. This guy has a, a farm with a, of 100 acres. But he was there cleaning in the conference. Yeah, so it's how you teach the people. The, our people here, eh? we've given them horns, wings, and I don't know whatever else. So they feel like that. So we, we need to first reteach them and say, hey, look, whether you're the managing director or damaging director of what serving is for everyone. There is no one who is above serving. So uh, as you teach by and by, it happens. But also, you start with the younger generation. Because they get it quicker. And so when they grow up into it, uh, they will do it. Uh, the older people, sometimes they are too stuck in their ways. So, but it's really teaching that changes the game. There was a hand at back there. Yes, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. Apostle Moses, um, and by the name of Kiria Emmanuel, I passed a church called Ganda Restoration Ministries. Amen. Um, mine is not a question, but it's also needed in such a gathering. It's just a thanks, a word of thanks to mm -hmm. Apostle Mo and uh, Apostle Kalanzi Moses. I met Apostle Kalanzi Moses on Facebook. Actually, I saw them in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the gathering of sons and daughters. So I mastered his name and sent him a friend request on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Then he told me, Emma, just come to Mpiji. We won't talk on Facebook, but come to Mpiji. I feared, how am I going to do it? I'm a man of a low person, a, a low you know, status. How am I going to meet him? I have a car and a motorcycle. So I said, should I drive or oh, ride a bike? <laughs> you get me? So my mind told me, no, don't, don't waste your time. Just jump on your bike and go. When I reached there, the first thing he told me, I drive a wish. I said, wow, I'm in the right place. Because I, I would find somebody maybe with, with a hammer, you know, with, the, with an ML. So I felt at home. I said, okay, here, I'm on the right what? Bless. Then he told me words that have really changed my ministry. Mm -hmm. It was about sowing, which you've been talking about a few minutes ago. And my testimony is, through what he told me and what you told us at Wash, Wash, Wash Harvest, I was struggling with something. Actually, I told Apostle Kalanzi that we are only owning five chairs, one speaker, and uh, a mixer. Others we were hiring. We talked. He told me everything, how I can stand a ministry and be, it become successful. Actually, when I came to, 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 to your place, I had a friend who, called, who, who told me he's go, she's going to be my mom from the U.S., but, you know, that door had closed. It's now back. It 
now back because of the prayer you prayed for me. So upon this issue of sowing, I was struggling. We collected 120,000 shillings, the whole church, to buy chairs and the remaining machines. So I went to my spiritual father after learning about honor. When I went there, it was a miracle service. And I went there and said, you know, Father, all the money we've been struggling with to pay for machines and chairs, we are giving it to your church. It was little money, but we, we needed it. So we did that act and gave him the money to our father church or our mother church. He, hear what happened. Last month, my in-law, a lift nut canoe, had to pack a whole rolly of machines and chairs to my home. Wow. We needed only 50 chairs and uh, one speaker. But right now, as I'm speaking, in the room for our visitors, machines are there and other mixers. Praise Jesus. So just, just, just put whatever Ap Apostle Mo is teaching us into practice. And things work. I think we are going to have one more. Or oh, is it two more? Or oh, they are online, eh? Oh, we have some online. So let's have uh, the pastor. Oh, oh, you're next. Okay. Then him and then online and we close. Praise God. Amen. I'll try to be very fast. I'm Brenda. Uh, but most of you will know it as Chigo, born of God Ministries. I'm greatly honored to be here. You said, who do you have that you shake to? One of them is you. Truly, I shake even to just your message. I do. And I respect all the worship harvest pastors and the ministers. You've changed my life. Um, what I want to, uh, the last time I was in the, in the mentorship, we talked about missional communities. And you gave me response. So I said, what am I waiting for? My dad gave me response. So I went and we launched last week. We started with five missional communities. Wow. Wow. Yes, I bless God. We had three people that very day get saved. On Sunday, wow. we had three. And yesterday, we had three. Hey. And today I expect that there are more because they have gone out for evangelism. Hey. But it's not just people, it works. Yeah. For me, I can't, anyway, I can't just talk. It works. I hope we just listen and learn. So what I'm asking, you've been talking about finances. How do we handle the finances in missional communities? What do they collect for? And what does it do? Hmm. Thank you very much. God bless you. Wow. I think Apostle Moses Kalanz has more experience with money in mission communities. I think they collect and bring to the church. In our mission communities, they mostly collect to fund mission of frontiers. Uh, they don't collect the tithe or the offering. They just collect to fund mission of frontiers. The tithe and offering, they bring it to the church. Yeah. But they collect to fund frontiers and to help one another internally. Yeah. Yes, sir. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Apostle Mose and Apostle Collins for having us here today. I'm Samuel Muganzi Salongo. Come on now. Yes. I, was, I was just trying to look around in the world when we don't get Okay, um... <laughs> I come from the HDR Ministries in Kabawa, and uh, you've been teaching and talking about church planting and uh, a thousand micro churches. And I believe that uh, it's very timely, and the Lord is speaking to us to 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 do this. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Ghana. And um, it, it's what I'm talking about these days. I looked at how, how these guys are planting churches. And I was like, wow. And I was telling somebody that um, we, we have a problem here in Uganda. The pastor will see a church in the neighborhood and will think that's a problem. I was in Kumasi 
in Ghana. And I was counting churches. They're just like umbrellas that you spoke about. And all of them have people. Yeah. So I was talking to a bishop who was hosting me. I said, are you guys, how, are there people in that church? What about that one? I mean, just around the place, many, many churches. And so I feel that we must adapt it as, I mean, as, as men and women of God in Uganda. And then um, I preached for one branch of ICGC, Dr. Mesa Otabel. And uh, in that place, which is like maybe, Entebbe is big. Uh, the, the location is smaller than Entebbe. There are about 10 churches of Dr. Mesa Otabe. Yeah. So I'm talking to the, 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 the hosting pastor. Why do you have so many churches? I said, doctor said, if you don't plant it there, something else will be there. Or some other person will be there. So the best thing to do is plant churches. And I was asking, are there people in each church? So yeah, just like you saw this one, there are people in every church. So I believe that the Lord is calling us to really go out into church planting. Let us go everywhere, you know. And so when you were teaching, I felt that the Lord was speaking to us. And thank you so much, please. Awesome. Online. Thank you so much. Um, two questions. Uh, one is, um, how does a pastor who is in a church that has a definite rigid leadership structure, what we call mainstream churches, get to apply such wisdom in terms of building leadership capacity for the church and finance administration? That's question That's one. Second question. The second question is, um, I agree that the church staff should all be practitioners um, of, this guy, they should all be mission or community leaders engaged yeah. in discipleship. How did we transition? How did you transition from the old way of not having all of them leading um, or being actively engaged in discipleship to this way where everyone is engaged in it? Look, if, if volunteers are leading mission communities and then you were even paying you to work here and you don't lead, you, please. Yeah, some things they don't need too much explanation. Yeah. If, 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 yeah, if you work in a hospital, you should have basic knowledge on treating people. <laughs> you can't say, ah, me, I'm an admin. A person is there needing uh, what first aid, please. Some things should be essential. So the core business of the church is to make disciples. We can't pay anyone who is not involved in that. If you're in a, another church, you know, submit and pray and ask for permission to try out things. I don't advocate rebellion or even half rebellion or 10% rebellion or a little rebellion. Any rebellion doesn't work. So you go talk to your leader, your supervisor, tell them, I've been praying about this. I want to try out this, this. Do I have permission to try out? Ask to try out. Yeah, and then you'll try out. This time I'm done for real. Uh, thank you so much, Apostle Mose. Uh, guys, before we go, uh, I just, please be seated. Uh, Apostle Mose has written several books. I call them wisdoms. And you know his wisdom is pragmatic, so you need to buy these books. I bought 12 pieces on honor and I shared them with the leaders here. And one of the leaders said that, hey, I've been having a fight with my father. But when I, she read this, she was crying and then she changed her attitude towards the father and things are working for her. Pastors who are here, if you don't have these books, because in the, and I've been reading them and I'm rereading them, I really encourage you. Someone said that, the problem with us is that we don't access wisdom. And because we don't access wisdom, we don't read. Me, I've coped reading culture. The leaders here at Wonders Christian Center are readers. We copy everything that is working. You see these lights here? Uh, 
the Honorable Bishop Macharia invited me in his church. And then I asked him that, where do you get these lights? And then he gave me someone who does the same thing in another church. So I called the lady. She did all this. So we, we, are, we are professional hey. at copying. See, I used to spend much energy casting out demons because I am good at casting out demons. Look at me. I am good. But when we were up there, I would... Strange miracles. One day, a lady came in. She was expectant, almost four months. I said, tomorrow by this time, you give birth. So I went to Kenya. They called me that the lady you said she has delivered. But all those people whom I dealt with deliverance, they are not here. So now these days I disciple, I teach and I teach and I teach. And you know, Apostle, we are following you. And we will get there, but we are following. Amen. Yes, the other, there are other things I know, but the things I don't know, I'm going to follow. Even the way you... you uh, <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> Listen, guys, it is good to, it is good to, it is good to copy what is working. What is not working? See, me, me at least I'm past 20, 21. I cannot copy what is not working. No, I cannot be fooled. If I am copying something, it is working. See, I'm past the age of being a liar. Me, I tell truth. Yeah. Me. When it comes to miracles, I know how to do miracles. Even Otim knows. We can prophesy. Me and Otim, we can prophesy. Yeah. But we need to... <laughs> let, me know, let me know. So, Basumba, you need to buy these books. This book, Honor, it is a terrible book. It's a terrible book. For us, we are reading. Apostle, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I remember one day we were in the mentorship and Apostle told us, go and buy stuff for your wives. I said, what am I going to do for Violet? I said, okay. And then I did it. Small things, but are practical. Are you guys being blessed? Cool. So we are going to give an offering, but I'm going to ask my wife to say hello to you. And uh, See, me, me and Violet, we've been married for 14 solid years. I must tell you there, we've had many fights, but I had to, to, to work out our marriage. I, I must, there are some people who say, for us, our marriage is good. Those people are liars. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you, the first time when we were one year, she, the way she was squeezing the, the deli dent, the toothpaste, Colgate, in the middle, I said, come here, lady. This is how you do it. And now we, we, we are better. There are many of <laughs> we, we are better. Let me give you one story. One day, I, I keep on traveling. And when I travel, come back. I don't even relax. I just come straight to church. So she reports me to a team. So I had, like, like what you said. You know, when a pastor, you don't have nobody to tell you. You, you, you become funny. So Tim called me say with his word, I said, So we talked and we <laughs> anyway. You say hi to these people and then we get done. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is a blessing to have all of you here. What an honor to have all this anointing in this house. Yes. Thank you, Apostle Mo. You know, I didn't sleep. I was all over. Was it a dream? Is it happening? Is he coming? Thank you, our coaches. You know, it is really wonderful. Thank you, the worship harvest team for choosing to come here this evening. It is an honor to have you. Thank you, everyone. It is good to see all of you pastors. I have seen my dear friend, Pastor Kutesa. He's just around there. Uh, Pastor Kutesa, can you stand up? Is he? Yeah. 
Please, please, these people have not seen you. Just, just when you stand up. He's such an amazing man. And all of you pastors, we are going to give an offering, but feel free if you don't want to give. Because I've learned not to coerce people. Because I remember I used to coerce people, and then you, they bring the books, what do you? And then when I accessed the, the coaching space of Pastor Chris, Straightforward Financial Growth, I began to separate my money from church money. Yeah. I used to mix Lucada money from, with church money. And then in there, I remember the, 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 the financial committee on Sunday, they collect the offering. They give it to me. I keep it in the office there. So whoever is coming, I say, go, church kutawanya, I give, I give, I give, I give. And then hearing the wisdom of Apostle Mose, I said, hey, this man is rebuking us, but politely. But now I am better. I'm better. Thank you so much, our coaches. Please get your offering if you can. That's okay. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for the great wisdom that has been shared with us through our coaches, through the pastors, and through Apostle Mose. Thank you for the great team that has labored all this night, all these days, the team at Wonders, to make this day a great success. As people are giving in whatever way they can, bless every single one of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Please, you are going to